Welcome everyone, we will get started in just a second. For those who joined us last week, I can't tell you how relieved I am to see you each entering with your own name. <laughs> we had a little mix up last week. That was a lot of fun, but we don't need to repeat it, so. I can't believe that was only last week. <laughs> Kathleen, I'm ready to go whenever you are. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Planning for Sustainability, from vision to implementation. We're gonna do a deep dive into the role of city planning, zoning, and land use codes in achieving climate and sustainability goals. This is the nuts and bolts behind how our, those great big ambitious goals we all set actually get accomplished. And we are joined today by Christine Grimondo. Portland's Director of Planning and Urban Development. Portland is in the process of a major initiative called Recode Portland, which will have its regulations better reflect the vision in its comprehensive plan and the goals of that really incredible climate plan called One Climate Future. There are implications for housing and equity and climate resilience and transportation, and we are so glad to have Christine with us today. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters, Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 8, members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from Christine and then tackle questions at the Q&A session in the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send those questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you and I will keep track and ask those during the Q&A at the end. You can message Will Sedlak with any technical difficulties. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thanks again for joining us and Christine, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Kathleen, and thanks for having me today. Um, I will note that that photo you um, threw up of me, which I, which I like, that is, um, that was, uh, I had just gotten off a plane and I, a red eye and I was standing in Dublin and uh, back when we traveled and it was also um, uh, back before uh, Recode started. So I had fewer gray hairs and everything uh, in there too, but that's, so you gave me like a, a nice memory uh, there. Uh, hopefully we're headed there, headed there again in some form uh, soon. So thank you so much. Um, that was a great intro uh, for what I'm gonna talk about uh, today. Again, I'm Christine Gramondo. I'm Director of Planning and Urban Development for the City of Portland. I've been with the city since 2014. I've been in this role about two years, uh, and I was a senior planner with uh, the department uh, before that. Um, I am going to talk about Recode Portland. It's a multi-year multi initiative uh, that we are in the middle of. Um, and But before I get into the nitty gritty of Recode Portland, I do want to um, I want to start with our comprehensive plan, which Kathleen mentioned, because uh, it's a critical part of this story and it really kind of uh, sets us up for what we're doing uh, in Recode here. Um, oh, okay, so Portland's plan. Um, one moment. I thought I was, um, excuse me, I thought I was sharing, but I, I wasn't yet. So I will bring it up right now and I'm sorry uh, for the delay. So. There we go, that's better. So um, Portland's plan 2030 is what the city calls uh, its comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2017, uh, which is still makes it still pretty fresh. It was also 
a, a multi-year initiative. Um, and I, I see actually, I see there are some um, planners on the call. So some of this will be familiar, but to folks, uh, for, for, for those who are new to, to comprehensive plans, um, just, just briefly, it is a, it is grows out, it comes out of a state requirement. It comes out of the state's growth management act. It contains a number of standards to help communities guide growth, uh, as well as, as conservation and a number of things, most communities uh, in the state. Uh, of course, communities in this state uh, vary greatly in resources and needs and scale. Uh, and, and the way this comprehensive plan um, requirement is framed actually gives communities a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, and creativity if they, if they um, creativity in this uh, for addressing these standards and making it work uh, for the needs of, of each place. Um, so it's a flexible tool in that way uh, to help uh, communities try to kind of set parameters to, to guide their future. Um, and, and it includes requirements for a number of different uh, subjects that everyone has to address in some way. These words on the right, uh, working waterfront, nodes and corridors. These are some of the ways we're talking about uh, these issues in Portland's plan. Uh, the state language you know, has requirements on economy uh, and housing and, and uh, historic resources and, and sustainability and a number of other things uh, in there. All those things are addressed in our plan. Um, but before we got there, we, got, we took a huge amount uh, of public input. I say we, this is actually a process we ran uh, almost all with um, sort of a staff led uh, initiative. And it was a great opportunity uh, to get into the community and talk to people about what mattered to them. And we did a lot of, we did some regular sorts of meetings uh, in our, in city hall um, in, 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 uh, with our council and with our planning board. But we also hit the streets and, uh, and went into neighborhoods, went to first Fridays and farmers markets and in this case, on this photo, this is uh, students from Casco Bay High. Student events were always my, my favorite. Uh, and we got um, uh, thousands of pieces of, of input uh, through all kinds of sort of creative exercise, like this one we're doing here, uh, was to get them to imagine uh, the headlines of the future they wish to see. And I have to say that day, their headlines were better than, than our real headlines. That day in uh, late 2016, uh, and it was just a heartening event, but we also got uh, we also got wonderful feedback from all quarters of the community. Uh, we wanted to reach people who didn't always um, who didn't necessarily always participate in this sort of process. We have our regulars, we value our regulars, um, and and they matter too. People who follow this sort of thing uh, year to year, uh, issue to issue. Uh, but we really wanted to get to people who didn't know anything about planning or comp planning or zoning uh, and have conversations with them, tremendously valuable. Uh, and it got us a, a, a great plan. It's about 100 pages on the policy recommendations uh, front. Um, there's some additional info, um, historic background and appendices and things like that. 100 pages of, of recommendations. I've just sampled a few of our sustainability goals um, and, and put these on the slide on the, on the right. Um, but one thing I'll say, because uh, I, I, won't, I won't read from the plan, but I think some of the important takeaways from this document is that the plan really tried to embrace what can cities do well? What, 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 what about their form? What about when they're functioning uh, at their best um, can be harnessed? Things like, can we make it easier not to drive? Can we make it, uh, can we build and develop this city uh, in a way that, um, supports uh, land use and transportation policies in a in a really sort of synergistic way, um, and, uh, and and there's a big sort of focus on, on energy efficiency, on transportation networks, on on um, land use and how how and where housing occurs, among other things, uh, as well. Um, there's a vision uh, set of circles on the left of this slide. This is a synthesis of uh, our vision statement. And these are things that, um, these are principles that cut across all of the sections of this document. Um, so there's an economy section, as I said, and a housing section and all these things. This vision statement is meant to say, 
um, as we're as we're considering new policy, as we're investing in this place, we should be also considering these high level goals around sustainability and connectivity and, and, and equity and these things that kind of cut across uh, these different subjects uh, in, a, in a holistic way. And this vision has been tremendously important as we move into Recode, as are the individual recommendations uh, that came out of the many um, chapters of the plan. Uh, a little bit more on, the, on uh, Portland's plan. Uh, this is a map that shows what some priority areas for that we think could accommodate um, more growth. It aligns with our transportation network as it is at the moment. Um, there's a kindred plan uh, map that also shows where our priority open spaces are and where our uh, trail connection improvement priorities are and, and things like that. This is just a small sample of this framework and the lens uh, that we brought to some of these housing and mix of uses and, and as well as open space. Again, the goal of the, of the comp plan is really uh, to guide growth, including guiding conservation uh, and, and as sort of the flip side of that kind of rubric of thinking about how we, grow, how we change what we preserve as well. So that is all lead into why recode, what is recode, um, our recode is, I said, a multi-year initiative um, to, to evaluate our land use code. Land use code is not um, the most common term because it's a term we use as kind of an umbrella name for a number of things, a number of types of regulations that we, uh, that we bundle together. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about these now. But it's a tremendously important document um, that is not about vision, it's about, um, it's about uh, the regulations that ideally should flow out of that vision and flow out of that comprehensive planning process to help us achieve uh, our ends. And it's more granular, it's more technical. Um, if you look at our comp plan, which I encourage you to do, it is really fun. Uh, I think our land use code is fun. I don't know if everyone would call it that. It's not a beach read uh, necessarily, but it is, um, it's a very compelling document with implications for the physical city and, and um, the, the, the urban fabric uh, of this place. We have had a, a, a land use code uh, and the attendant regulations, zoning regulations uh, for a long time. We've had zoning since the 20s. Um, the last time this document was fully redone was, was Sputnik was happening. Um, a lot has changed then, since then. I'm sure we were also talking about some of the same things uh, in uh, over 50 years ago, but, um, but, but it's a different city, it's a different world and it really warrants a, a new holistic look. Um, that said, this has not been um, a static document. It's a document that we have engaged with uh, and amended many, many times over the years, probably dozens and dozens of times um, year to year to keep it up to date. And so the end result of that um, is that uh, our land use code was, it was um, about a thousand pages uh, it, it contained a, a, a good deal of, of good planning practice, of best practice, of progressive new ideas uh, that had gone on, got, been sort of layered in over the years. It also contained some redundancies, some inconsistencies, some really dated things, uh, really because it had not been um, holistically looked at, but had been sort of appended uh, for so long. And so, Recode intends, um, first of all, to create a more sensible document, to take that thousand page uh, somewhat dated document and blow it up and put it back together again. And we actually just finished that, what we call phase one, which took uh, that, that, um, that beast of a document and, and made it um, more accessible and leaner and more consistent and more useful. Um, and the code itself includes all these things, includes our zoning regulations, Zoning for folks not uh, familiar with that is where, it's how we say um, what can happen and where. Where can certain uses happen? Where can, where can industry take place? Where can housing take place? To what intensity? Uh, to what urban form and design and things like that? It's also our environmental regulations. It's also where we look at stormwater, housing policy, historic preservation, public art, uh, a whole lot of other things that that, um, that relate to each other 
um, are in this document. So we, I mentioned we um, be doing it um, in a couple of phases. So the restructuring has happened. We just implemented uh, phase one. Um, it went into effect uh, December 2020, so it's really fresh. Um, but the big project now, phase two, um, is to look at our code's policy and see how it aligns with the goals of our comprehensive plan. Where are we falling short? Where, if we continue to build in the patterns we're building, um, will we diverge with what we think we are, what we think our values are? And so that is really the crux of what we're doing right now uh, in phase two. So I mentioned restructuring. I just wanted to show, uh, I have actually never printed out our new code, but if you were to, the one on the top is that much smaller document. Uh, we like to throw this up to show how much um, dead weight we dropped uh, out of the code coming out of phase one. I do want to mention phase one. We, we did do some policy work in there as well. We started chipping away uh, at some um, important topics and some what we call sort of low hanging fruit. We revamped our accessory dwelling unit regulations. Accessory dwelling units are where um, how you allow, uh, some places allow for, um, for accessory housing uh, to be sort of companion uh, housing on a, a lot where you might already have a, a, a principal structure, a primary house. It's often uh, an accessory to single family homes. We actually allow it on lots of different types of residential lots. And it's allowed, it, it's, um, it's there to really allow sort of an incremental level, uh, kind of a very organic way uh, for neighborhoods um, to uh, add some additional housing in, in the uh, over time. And so that happened. Uh, and that was a great change uh, and really kind of opened up how that could happen and made more explicit how that could happen across the city. Um, we also did some major parking uh, standard changes. Um, so uh, parking is important. I think any place I've ever been where people want to be, they've also complained about parking uh, in some ways. Um, well, so, so that's, um, that's a, maybe a constant in my career is, is, is hearing concerns about parking. It's a real thing, managing it, figuring out the right amount, um, but it is, but building more parking is not the only response to, uh, to, to concerns or complaints around, around parking. I think um, planning um, needs to also look at, are there other ways we can encourage um, people to, um, to move through this city and get to this city? And it's not just uh, public transportation, I recognize that a lot of places cannot uh, support uh, public transportation and there's only so much um, or, or we can support different kinds and different amounts than a larger city. Um, but things like, um, are there ways, uh, if you are near transit to get an exemption, uh, if you are um, near, um, if you do anticipate a shared vehicle provision or, or more biking uh, because of your location or, or what you're sort of co-located next to, um, there are abilities to kind of wave out of some of these things and free up, um, potentially free up pavement to not be pavement or pavement to be used for something that provides us other value like, uh, like additional housing and potentially lower cost housing as well because we've take, taken some of that cost away if, if it's a part of the project to build. Um, EV charging provisions is, was also part of the uh, changes we recently uh, put in to require certain infrastructure go in. Uh, for projects of certain scale. So we did a, we did a, a robust look at parking um, to try to um, encourage other things and, and waivers where appropriate uh, and to try to start uh, shifting that conversation a little bit more to alternatives as well. Um, so now we're in phase two and phase two of Recode is evaluating this code. I think the heart of the, part of phase two is really looking at um, our zones, again, our zones are what um, really kind of prescribe uh, what sort of buildings and development and other associated infrastructure, whether it's stormwater or street trees or lighting or where and how they occur. Uh, and we're looking at that code through a strong equity lens, through a thought, strong climate resiliency lens and doing in the middle of a code audit um, to see if there are gaps and places we should be um, looking or doing better or, or, or making changes. Um, and that audit should be done. Um, we've started thinking about this, of course, but we expect to have an audit in hand um, sometime this month. Uh, I put the color of law there on the left. Um, 
that is a book uh, that got a lot of um, discussion in the last year. Uh, it's a great book, and it's on a topic. Um, it's a, it's about how um, policies and zoning and and lending practices and other things really have contributed uh, to a legacy of segregation uh, in this country along along race lines, also along class lines as well, um, and uh, and how that informed early zoning codes. Uh, we've done a lot since our early zoning was first put into place, but it's still a salient uh, question to look at. Uh, are there places, are there legacies of those, um, of that history that's still in our code, or even that uh, sort of earlier establishment of our, uh, of our zoning regulations uh, aside, in addition to looking what's back, looking forward, is there anything there now that we think from an equity perspective is presenting challenges, Presenting barriers to people um, that we can remove uh, for uh, for a more uh, that is also uh, part of the lens to the graphic on the right. That's also in our comprehensive plan. It has another um, rendering of that that vision I keep um, mentioning and throwing up on the screen. And this graphic is really to show um, one of the ways we like to think about how to use a comprehensive plan. And it is our highest level sort of uh, 10,000 feet level uh, document and other things will flow out of that. It informs a lot of the other work we do, including, um, including the code I'm talking about today, but including that um, one climate future work um, that we're doing as well with South Portland. Uh, it, the, the, the comprehensive plan, it's, um, it's comprehensive in a sense, but it's more breadth than depth. It's not a deep dive on anything. And certain things need deeper dives. And so the climate work we're doing is really kind of building on some of the climate resiliency recommendations in Portland's plan and, and, and amplifying and, and giving us uh, that robust uh, process that's also going to kind of inform the process. I just can't, as a planner, I sort of can't not um, uh, sort of revel in these zoning maps because I'm mentioning we, we are evaluating our zoning. There's uh, it. There's an element of that that involves looking back, as I mentioned, through our history. How did the patterns that we see now, as many changes have we made over the decades, when were they set? How are they set? How much are we sort of following a path uh, laid out in the 20s? Uh, and there's great paths that were laid out in the 20s in terms of our street network and, and before uh, our 19th century city too. It's a, it's, it's a great template uh, in many ways, um, but it still, it still um, is informative. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to look at sort of where, um, what happened post-war uh, to, our, to our neighborhood patterns uh, and, and how we've grown uh, since. So we're, we're in a process of looking through the historic city and how it got us to that colorful and sort of messy map on the right, which is one of the things we'll be looking at. Do these zones, those are our zones, each color is a zone that um, again prescribes what can happen in any area of the city. Do they make sense, both in their boundaries and their content? Do any of them can be combined? Or are all of them working? Are they doing things we want them to do uh, from a housing, from a landscaping, from stormwater, all, any number of things, uh, other uses, things like that, uh, that we're looking at. I mentioned uh, One Climate Future, uh, and I wanted to just give it a more formal nod as well. This is a process, um, the, the plan that's um, it didn't actually, was not managed out of the planning department, but we work closely with our sustainability coordinator, sustainability office on this. Um, and uh, it, of course, it's a joint project with South Portland. We haven't done much of uh, that. Uh, I think it's been fabulous to, um, to talk about these things uh, sort of across the municipalities uh, and, and with a uh, sort of wider lens and a, and a certain extent a regional lens uh, and look at what we can do, be doing from a buildings and energy and transportation and, and land use uh, perspective as well. That project recently wrapped as well and is already informing how we're looking at uh, implementing. Two. Um, again, I wanted to sort of again get into that, that granular piece uh, of actually looking at our, our code, um, which is at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, a regulatory document that we really need uh, to dig into. So looking at our maps, I, I gave the sort of overall city maps. Um, this, is a, this is a detail of, uh, of a, 
area of East Bayside, we actually received requests from property owners sometimes to change um, to change zoning designations. And then we, as a city, decide, uh, does this request meet a city goal? Does it make sense? And I think they're often um, requests that come in partly because we have not holistically evol um, evaluated that code in so long that there are some um, gaps there or discrepancies of um, maybe what a local need is uh, and what the code says. So here's an example of a parking lot in East Bayside uh, that had zoning that didn't really allow uh, much to change. We did change the zoning to a mixed use zone. It now allows uh, uh, rental apartments. Uh, there's a community space and a restaurant on the ground floor. It was a good process. Um, that came through as an individual application, but generally we're hoping to do this um, again citywide, uh, take a lens to the entire map and say, where can we anticipate where this needs gonna be? Uh, also there's, um, uh, I've showed you the binders of, of that document. It's not just maps. There's a, um, there are texts with performance standards, environmental review standards, um, dimensional standards, things like that. And so we're really digging in uh, to the um, sort of very detailed work of um, evaluating uh, what is permitted uh, by the code uh, and what performance standards we put on them to achieve sound ends. So um, uh, I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit um, and, and take you out of the actual um, tables of the code. So, uh, and back to what does this mean? Uh, what does land use policy mean for this moment? Um, I think these are some of the ways we will be incorporating uh, climate and sustainability, uh, that lens and looking at our code for potential changes, uh, including looking at recommendations coming out of the One Climate Future Plan. I mentioned we've already um, put in new EV infrastructure requirements. Uh, TDM is short for uh, transportation demand management that gets back to that parking issue. Are we asking um, uh, developers, particularly large scale new developments, um, not just for adequate parking, but uh, a demonstration for again, things of a certain scale. Not everyone has to do this. A demonstration that they are investing in ways to get people to and from uh, their site and, and on our city streets in different ways, um, whether that's shuttles uh, or transportation investments uh, or ride shares or, or bike infrastructure investments and things like that. Um, that is um, something we're working strengthening all the time is what are we asking for for TDM um, that, that, that will be uh, robust to see us into the next uh, decade or so. Housing that is efficient and affordable. I think housing is such an important issue at, from so many facets uh, in the city and in the state. I was just reading about new studies that just landed about sort of national housing issues from an affordability and supply uh, perspective. Um, it's so important. Um, but where housing is uh, and what form it takes uh, has everything, I think, to do with that sort of transportation, land use, sustainability linkage um, and how we're coordinating those two. Are we putting density and energy efficient multifamily housing in places it needs to be so people can access their work, can access transit, and if they're not getting on transit, can still do enough uh, on foot, on bike, and uh, in, uh, in their neighborhoods to meet their needs. And we have another principle that's in that uh, comprehensive plan is we talk a lot about complete neighborhoods. Does every city, uh, neighborhood in the city have um, the amenities and the resources to be what we call uh, complete neighborhoods. That doesn't mean we expect every neighborhood in the city to look alike, to function alike, to be um, of the exact same intensity or anything like that. Um, there's a place for, for different kinds of contexts, but that, that every place should have uh, a certain amount of clustering of things they need to not make uh, it necessary to drive everywhere uh, for everything or um, to cut people off from things they need. Uh, housing leads right into uh, TOD, which is transit oriented development. Um, and again, lining up that transportation and land use uh, part um, just uh, to be able to shift people over the different ways um, of moving around. And um, of course, coastal city in a coastal state with rising seas, uh, we are talking a lot about uh, coastal resiliency. And I think there's actually still a lot for us uh, to do here. 
uh, in the coming year with, with uh, recode phase two and also outside of recode and in, in, uh, in building codes uh, and in other places that we deal with city infrastructure and private infrastructure too. Um, there's an equity lens to thinking about resiliency as well when we look at areas where we know there's going to be um, anticipated increases in inundation and things like that, who, um, who's most likely to be affected by that in terms of um, vulnerable communities and, and things like that. Questions we're trying to layer upon each other as we um, did do some early consideration of um, on our waterfront, allowing for raised first floors for flood proof, the additional flood proofing things like that. Um, and I think it was a little premature for where our community was. It involved allowing buildings to actually be a little taller, which is always a sensitive topic. If, if that height that would gain was um, explicitly to allow for a more resilient ground floor, um, I think at that point, it really, that topic really, really was clear to us, benefited from uh, the, our climate plan to be done and be sort of bundled into, again, a holistic picture. How are we approaching this? Um, and what what are our priority actions uh, going forward on uh, sea level rise and coastal resilience? I think that takes me to the end. Um, so thank you so much. I encourage you to check out our Recode Portland site. Um, it also ties into our comp plan, and there's some great explorations of those early zoning maps, um, other ways we're addressing direct connections to how are we going to implement our new climate plan. Uh, and other things as well. There's an interactive um, complete neighborhoods uh, link as well, where you, if you live in Portland or if you're just curious, can zoom in on different areas and see where, what would you have access to if you were to be dropped uh, in Woodford's Corner uh, as far as resources and walkability and things like that, that we just built. Um, and it's really fun, I think. Uh, so please take a look. Thank you so much. Glad to uh, take questions or talk. Thank you so much, Christine. And I, I love that. I can't wait to explore all of those, those resources. And just so everybody knows, we will include a link to Recode Portland in the follow-up email later this afternoon. Uh, if like me, you do not live in Portland and you're wondering what planning looks like at your local level, uh, I encourage you to, to find out your town website or town office. Uh, should be able to direct you to the, the local planning board and attend a meeting, see what it's like. But we'll also ask Christine some questions about, it might give us some insight into to planning across the state. Uh, so I guess the first question, Christine, is do, do all main cities and towns have comprehensive plans? Is it required? That's a great question. I, um... I qualified that a little bit. I started talking about state requirements. It is not, um, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated answer. It is required if you're a community with zoning in this state, um, just, to get, just to get wonky for a, for a second. But if you're a community with zoning, you need to have your zoning uh, as well as some other things. Uh, there's an infrastructure and, and investment component. Primarily there's this really strong link between zoning and comprehensive planning that state growth management act that they need to be consistent so a comprehensive plan having the state say your comprehensive plan is consistent with the growth management act and then having your zoning be consistent with your with your comp plan means um means that you've you've done that work so it is possible to not have a comprehensive plan but then the question there's a you're you're sort of on your back foot as a community uh in sort of demonstrating you are meeting those standards comprehensive plan kind of front loads these big questions of this is how we're planning uh, for growth, for conservation, these sorts of things. It front loads all those things. Most communities in this state uh, have one. Uh, they take refreshing every so often. I think it's 12 years uh, and that and they take work. Uh, and so I think there's probably some that aren't quite fresh uh, and some that are and there's probably a couple of gaps out there. It doesn't mean you're immediately sort of shut down as an operation if you don't have one, but it's um, uh, but it's important, and it's important for, again, most places do have zoning in the state, with some exceptions, um, exceptions probably, and I think you find most of them have it, and there is kind of a basis in state law that you would be 
if called or if questioned, if the community is questioned uh, on certain things, the question of, well, are you, are you meeting these standards would be met and a comp plan helps you answer them in advance. Okay, that, that makes sense. And of course, you, as you said, it takes resources, right? It takes work, it takes staff capacity. Uh, many of us remember that there used to be a state planning office, which I'm gonna guess offered support on some of that. Is that true? And what happened to that support? Um, How did you well, manage to do still, this without that? Still state, there are still state planners. Um, I think some of those those functions were, were dispersed, as we know, there isn't a state planning office, but but our plan was reviewed by the state um, and there's still support as far as um, data and, and other communications. And we were certainly in, in um, uh, communication with uh, state planners. There aren't that many because uh, a lot of planning work happens locally uh, in Maine. Um, but there are a couple of great resources. Uh, Phil Carey is the person we work with. I'll also say, obviously not all um, communities have equal uh, resources or ability to do this. How, I think the state understands this too in their review. Um, and they vary, again, they vary widely in what they look like and, and where that you know, bar is. I think there's a lot of flexibility um, there's also um, our regional planning agencies, our COGS often lend um, assistance uh, to these initiatives as well. Um, there are consultants who do this. Uh, so there's different ways that communities can address it uh, or patch together resources they need. I mentioned we did it largely staff run. That's a different kind of resource. We didn't pay $300,000 for a comp. I mean, that's a big number, but um, we didn't pay a huge amount for a comp plan. We, I, um, it, I, Spend a couple of years on it, and I and I brought a lot of other people uh, to the table, uh, which was wonderful. But I even even here we can't always do that uh, to have that sort of available staff resources uh, to do it. But in our case, it wasn't just uh, let's let's do this. So, so many ways to get there, and I think again the state um, acknowledges those those vast differences in our communities, and I think works with communities to help them find the right fit. Uh, for what they need. They don't all need to look like ours. Or anything. Yeah, and in fact, that, that makes sense, right? That a, a town, a city or town's comprehensive plan should really reflect the, the, that city or town. And I loved that picture of the, the Casco Bay High kids just imagining the, the headlines from the Portland of the future and, and what do we need to get there. Uh, and I also appreciate that it can be can be tough sometimes to get new voices into to these conversations. Are there any examples that sort of stand out to you from um, you know things that are in the comprehensive plan that maybe wouldn't have been if wouldn't have made it there if there hadn't been that broader participation? That is interesting because you know one of the things one of the things I remember thinking when we started this was. Well, we're never not doing some kind of long range plan. We're often going out to talk to people. I mean, and I think some communities, it's not like that. Because again, they have different needs and different ways of operating and different scales. Um, and so comprehensive plan might be their once in a decade way to have certain big policy discussions. And, and for us, we, we in, a, in a less kind of holistic way, but, but still in a robust way, we will do a transportation plan and go out and have a community meeting. We will talk about redesigning a public square and, and what that would look like. And so, so I remember going in thinking, I think I know what we're gonna hear. Like I kind of felt that way and I, I, shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't admit that, um, but I was like, I wonder how different it will be because we hear people are not shy also telling us what they think we should be doing or not and, and, and what could be going better at any time. Um, but it really did, it really did change. It was a different conversation. Um, we, Try to think of individual things that kind of got out. I think um, we heard a lot about aging in place that actually I wasn't anticipating. I think there are a number of things. We also, the act, I think us deciding we were really going to get out of our own comfort zones and the act of really switching up um, what tools we'd been using around engagement um, even made us realize, like, from a there are recommendations about, you know, I mentioned we talk about complete neighborhoods in one Portland. This idea, this sort of realization, like not everyone is a 
accessing things the same way or knows how to, to access things. I think that's reflected in the plan, this idea that accessible services and uh, city services and, and um, transparency and other things that of course are important uh, and, and resources for everyone uh, in, all over the city to be able to get to those things. I think those were almost new out of that, that process. And so other ways we, we tried to reach other people, just for example, we, um, we did try, we talked with different immigrant groups where there were language barriers and we brought in some, uh, we found some interpreters and translators. We didn't hit everyone. There's a lot of different people from all over the world here, um, but we tried to, again, go to them. We don't, we don't have time or interest in coming to City Hall. We will, we will attend a, a group in your, in your church basement, please, and, and have that conversation. One, one meeting, two meetings, we provided childcare. Um, not a ton of people took us up on childcare, but we were trying to figure out how do we get more, more people there. I think some of our best, um, uh, food always helps also. And I think some of our best experiences were, we had this table made in the shape of Portland um, where people could write on it. It was portable, it was like whiteboard paint. Um, uh, it was homemade, there's one of a kind, the base of it was like an old, um, uh, ironing board. I couldn't think of the word ironing board and you can tell how much I iron. Uh, and, uh, and a local maker space person made, made it, craftsperson. So like, I'll try to make a table like that. And so, so again, it wasn't super expensive, but it was unique. And we went out and, um, to parks and we went out to, to school events and things like that. And that just does um, uh, change it up, I think. So, so yeah, we got a richer plan. I mean, I think a lot of the themes, I, I was right in the sense of a lot of the themes were there. What got emphasis? What we what we heard mattered uh, the most, or even what we found hard to get feedback on sold us to some in some way. Like, wow, this doesn't this stuff doesn't resonate with everyone. Maybe we need to be learning new ways of framing the problem or the question uh, for people who aren't planner planner nerds. You know, and they're out there, and I I love a good planner, but not everyone uh, not everyone knew to be there. So. That was a long answer, but I love it though. I love, um, I, I want, I want a table. I think that's fabulous. I want a table like that to take to every meeting I go to. <laughs> and, and I love that, um, just how thoughtful you were throughout the process of, you know, what's resonating, where, where are we sort of a little, you know, we're just talking past people and how do we talk with each other? Uh, it's, it's fascinating. And it's a, a big job within the city limits. And then of course, there's the, the realization that Portland is not just Portland, it's part of a, a larger fabric of the, the community and the state. And clearly the One Climate Future being in collaborative with South Portland, you're, you're thinking about that. How does Portland's comprehensive plan and recode and all of that intersect with other adjacent communities? Hmm. These are, um, that's, a, that's a great question. I was just having, having a conversation with another planner in the region the other day about um, ways, to, ways to do this. I think, you know, Maine is uh, what we call a home rule state. It is actually not, um, there's regional planning going on, don't get me wrong, and any regional planners in the room, this, this I don't mean any, any slight. There's, it's hard to do regional planning in this, in this state, and there are benefits and disadvantages to um, to how it works here. It means we do have a lot of local control. It means we, um, locally is where the rubber hits the road on so many issues, um, not everything, but it also means um, it can be hard to uh, come up with a regional approach on certain things like ho housing, for instance. Transportation's one I think we're, we're certainly better at because it so obviously crosses state lines as do, um, you know, to a certain extent, uh, I mean, we know lots of things uh, across state lines, but certainly housing need crosses uh, is a regional issue. Um, homelessness is a regional issue uh, that we talk about uh, all the time, sort of our role in the, in the region in that, and that's, that's a contentious subject uh, sometimes. And um, uh, so transportation, certainly within the COGS, we, we participate with, with GP COG and PACS, and, and there are, each region will have their own version of that. Um, try to, to do better coordination on that. I think housing, still to my mind, we, we are working with other communities to try and get to the sense of uh, commitment for, I know, a lot, I know a number of communities that are looking at what can we do to 
diversify our housing policies, and that's great uh, to see. Um, but there's no arm to say you all shall hit a target or something like that. And I'm not saying that would be an easy thing to do uh, necessarily or to, to implement, but I think um, it, in Maine, there's no, there's not a mechanism to smooth, smooth that out. It's, it's a little more of a, a regional that that's really interesting, and and it it makes a lot of sense that there are are things that home rule makes way easier for us to sort of experiment with different policies and see what happens and learn from each other. And then there are also those points where you're like, huh, it'd be a heck of a lot easier if we were all on the same page on this, but that's all right. Um, you mentioned talking about looking at water infrastructure. And I know we've, we've got a few questions about uh, storm runoff and, and increased risk of flooding and, and all of those sorts of, of questions that you're grappling with. I wonder how, what can the city do to sort of alleviate those problems? Um, ah. These are all, I feel like that right there could be its own, its own lunch and learn, right? And, um, or maybe a lot of these, these things could be. Um, you know, there are a number of things we're doing. And again, I think our approach is gonna be different than, um, than a suburban or rural community um, because we do have more pavement, but there's um, not that we're, we we're, don't try to mitigate uh, pavement at, at times, but it does, um, in some ways, you know, that, that, um, that trade-off of yes, but you're denser and 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 closer to transit, for instance, has its own environmental um, win. Uh, then, if you spread the whole population out of Portland on acre lots through the region, there'd be a lot more pavement uh, in this watershed uh, than if we gather here in close proximity. So it's a different approach. Uh, we are working on. Um, I know for in, a, in terms of public space, uh, the green. We're working on new green infrastructure and improving like where, um, where we're, how we're using uh, spaces in our, in our streets and our esplanades and things like that to better treat water quality. We're also undergoing some major um, well, subsurface water infrastructure project. If you've been to uh, Portland anytime recently, it's hard to drive around right now. Uh, Back Cove is all torn up. That is um, Back Cove being a water body, but also a path and a, and a, and a neighborhood and all the, and, Beach we travel regularly. Uh, it is all torn up because um, there is going to be water quality improvements. At the end. This, is, this is stuff you'll never see when it's all put back together, uh, and and that's good. But those are slow, expensive things. That's been in the works for years, um, but that's a big thing. And then there's little things like, can we, yeah, can we make this uh, uh, this sidewalk esplanade do better with retaining water? Uh, can we have better green roof standards where we have them? We have one zone where we have them. Uh, in uh, in a variety of, of things, I think there's you know, a, a, a patchwork of, of approaches there. But um, always, uh, it's a it's a real it's a live issue, and it's a really important one, both from a quantity and quality uh, perspective. What what are we going to do with water, um, especially as 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 climate change is more more volatile uh, too. So we're I don't have the, the end answer on that. I have some of the things we're doing, but we all know there's, there's, there's a lot more to be talking about there as far as keeping up with this changing planet and changing the world. The other thing I'd add, um, again, to sort of get, get sort of granular from the regulatory perspective, um, but it's, it, it's important. This is one way we've addressed this. Uh, we recently adopted uh, impact fee ordinance uh, and the you know, impact fee ordinance was a way to get more systematic about uh, what, as new development comes online, what is, how do we support infrastructure to support that, or build up infrastructure to support that growth. And there was kind of a, a ad hoc way of doing some of that work with say, individual transportation uh, impacts of a project, for instance, and we'd figure out where the impacts were and figure out a number and improvement what, what the improvement would be. We, did, we implemented an impact fee system to, uh, that goes into three buckets. One is for um, transportation imp improvements, one is for uh, parks and recreation improvements and green space improvements, and another is for wastewater uh, and stormwater improvements as well. Uh, so again, those are um, things you don't always directly see, uh, but that long-term 
we're probably we're probably overdue for that for that tool. Um, but it's a great tool to start sort of building up uh, capacity. Of, you can't just not be planning uh, for growth and and what it what it does to our infrastructure. That's a till we're slowly growing uh, to help us with stormwater. That's fabulous. And, and Christine, this next question makes me very conscious of how uh, just expansive your work is. It feels like everything under the sun is probably your responsibility. So thank you very much. Uh, are you also thinking about the electric grid and how electricity demand is increasing? And there's some of that, you know, I just, what, What's your responsibility in the city of Portland? What's the state's responsibility? What's the utility's responsibility? How does all that get sorted out? Boy, um, well, I don't do all of that. I think I touch part of that. Um, again, uh, and I think a lot of my work and our work uh, here is like that. Uh, certain things are sort of squarely more centrally uh, in this, um, in this shop for sure, um, but it's very collaborative both with other departments. Public Works is, is really important partners of ours as well as other uh, government agencies too. And so I think utilities is one of those. So one of the ways we would address that, um, we are, we, from a new development perspective or in a zoning perspective, uh, we, uh, and we, we're always looking at ways we can improve this too, but we certainly we have certain um, ways we approach alternative energy and solar and other things to allow so to work them in uh, and, and to our context here and allow them to have that to happen. Uh, so that's one part of that uh, picture, uh, but that's a sort of a small increment. Again, that's getting to locally. What how do we address it uh, uh, locally, like project by project? And that's not the whole big picture, but. Um, but I think incrementally helps uh, that along. Um, the other thing, and also we, um, the other thing we do is we, we work with CMP. New things that come in have to kind of attest, uh, they have to have sign offs that show um, they, uh, they have what they need. Uh, but well, but I'm not doing sort of the bigger utility uh, policy work, but we touch it for sure. It all sort of everything connects at some. I love that. It just feels like there's so much exciting and cool work that you get to do and, and knowing that some of it ends up being uh, invisible at the end is, is kind of an interesting twist there. Where do you, where do you get inspiration? Who, whose work are you looking at either in Maine or around the country, around the world? Like where are you, what cities and towns are you looking at and saying, yep, that's where, that's where Portland's headed or that's what I want to learn from? Ah, that's a fun, that's a fun question. I, so first of all, we, I love poaching good ideas. Like I am not shy at, um, I mean, I think we regularly look at other communities around the world where what not that anything is just sort of simple fit you lay it on here and it works there's always a question of what does that mean here um and how does that fit our our context but we we love that i actually remember um when we were starting our comprehensive planning process there's again comp plans all around this state and and equivalents all around the country and i remember this i found this um and so we saw great examples of this um, but I remember just looking farther afield, like just city plans. And I, I saw this one in like Gothenburg, Sweden. I remember this randomly because my whole department was like, this is so cool, it's such a good plan. And then I met someone the other day from Gothenburg. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing Gothenburg correctly. Like great downtown plan. It was, you know, it was years ago uh, now. Um, but that said, I think planners, um, I think they're actually very generous. Uh, we pick up the phone and talk to our compatriots uh, regularly. Um, and I have, in, certainly in the case of Recode, I've had great conversations with other communities. Who, I mean, this whole nation is full of dated, ornate uh, codes and uh, in various places with addressing this, this issue. In some places, maybe it just works and we'll keep working, but a lot of communities are looking at, can we, can we get into the 21st century here? Um, and we, I've had great calls with our, our colleague, actually our near colleagues down in Somerville, who we talk to a lot, and Austin, 
Norfolk, Virginia has actually a great uh, plan in regards to climate and, and um, uh, climate resiliency. They have wonderful standards built into the code. And we've had long talks with them. And so, uh, so there's a lot of that. I would just also say like where you find inspiration. I, um, I think as a core issue, I still find it exciting. I walk past, um, uh, and sometimes, you know, everyone needs to be reminded of what excites them in their work sometimes. Uh, and I still uh, have books I love about this on my shelf that I'm looking at right now. I still, it still gets me uh, as important and, and good. I walked past my, one of our conference rooms the other day. We're now back in the office, which is its own strange good thing. Uh, and my colleagues had like the old school like maps and tracing paper and markers out. And I was, what? what is this? And, and they were doing like a, their own exercise a la recode of where, where, where does there seem to be patterns of groupings that don't necessarily, like they were just doing this thing with markers and maps. And I thought that's this is such a great group of enthusiastic people who still thinks that's, who gets why that's interesting and thinks it's fun. And, and my colleagues help, I think, because I have, I am fortunate enough to have this amazing group of people who likes to, who like uh, to talk about, um, maps and zoning and flooding and everything else with me. And I think I take inspiration from them all the time. Well, you are inspiring me. I feel like I haven't stopped smiling this whole conversation because it's just so, uh, so exciting to hear your enthusiasm and the, the work that's being done. I love this idea of a, a network of planners across the country and across the world who are sharing good ideas and being generous with each other and, and ultimately with all of us. Uh, so thank you, Christine. I would love your book recommendations because I want to get more, I want to know more about planning now. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to you for, for joining us today. I'll let everybody in a little bit behind the scenes and say uh, several of us at, at MCV had the opportunity to meet with a, a group of folks from Portland city government. And by the end of the conversation, we said, oh, we gotta get Christine for a lunch and learn. So thank you for humoring us. It has been a, a just wonderful conversation. Thanks to everybody for joining. And, and as always for your excellent questions and, uh, and for, for spending part of your day with us. You will Thank get you so an, much. You will get an email from us later this afternoon, everybody, with a, a link to Recode and uh, some ideas about how to follow up. You'll also have a link to sign up for next week's Lunch and Learn, which is Understanding Fisheries, Conflict, and Coexistence with Offshore Wind Energy. This is something that has been in the news quite a bit lately. And I know many of us are wondering how wind energy will affect current and future use of ocean space, including for fishing. So Dr. Allison Bates, who is an assistant professor of environmental studies at Colby College, will join us to share how scientists and policymakers are, are figuring this out. So there are lots of, of interesting challenges and tons of opportunities ahead. I hope you'll join us to explore those next week. Thank you. Christine, thank you everyone. Have a beautiful weekend.